So welcome to the uh, to the afternoon session. And uh, our first speaker this afternoon is Tetsu Hara. Um, I first met Tetsu when he was a student at MIT. I, I'm not sure whether I was on your thesis committee or not. Yes. I was, good. <laughs> Well, I can take a slightly more credit then. Um, and Tetsu was a student of uh, Chang Mei, who was here in the audience. And uh, following his, uh, following his uh, graduate school experience at MIT, I think he spent most of, most of your career at uh, Rhode Island, where he has developed a strong program uh, in AC interaction, and I think um, I think you would currently uh, consider I, I currently consider Tetsu among a handful of, of experts on on AC interaction, and uh, in particular on the the processes he's going to talk about today. So I I look forward to hearing what you have to say, Tetsu. Thank you very much again, and happy birthday. And <clears throat> first, I'd like to thank you, uh, uh, for organizers, for inviting me. And I really feel kind of great honor to be able to <coughs> uh, participate. Uh, let's see. So before we go to the actual talk, I just wanted to give a bit more about how I got to know Ken. And let's see. Anyway, so uh, I first met Ken, 1984, when I came to MIT from Japan as a kind of exchange student, originally. And I came to Parsons Lab, and I was very fortunate to be able to work with Chan uh, for almost five or six years. But, and of course, Chan is really known for his theoretical uh, applied math work. But what we did actually at the beginning, uh, our first project was not theory, but experimental. We wanted to kind of uh, validate the so-called black scattering theory against the observations. So as soon as I arrived at MIT, uh, basically I was told I have to do the experiment. And at that time, we had this very nice wave tank, which was, of course, used by Ken and his students. So almost from the beginning, I had to get a lot of help from uh, Ken, and particularly Ken's uh, student at that time. Uh, I really had to uh, learn everything uh, from them. So, I, from, really, from the beginning, uh, my affiliation with Ken <laughs> started. And uh, towards the end of my uh, MIT study, I did more theoretical work. But once I left MIT, I then uh, got the job in the physical oceanography, and I did most of my work in AC interaction. So obviously, Ken's uh, work, particularly those uh, cutting edge experimental work was always the inspiration for my career. So I just wanted to thank you, Ken, for all your excellent work and influence you have to me, on me. Anyway, so, anyway. <clears throat> so going back to this title. <clears throat> so I'm not really a person who can do a lot of new things, uh, but I tend to kind of dwell on the same problem for a long, long time. And so what I'm talking about is the wind over waves, which I think is probably one of the most uh, old classic problem of AS interaction. And some people probably think uh, what's left to do. But to me, there are still a lot of uns unanswered questions. And in a sense, I really don't think we really know much about what's going on of the wind over waves. Although we can do modeling and predictions OK, we're kind of counting a lot of guessing. Uh, that's my opinion. Anyway, so uh, I had the opportunity to work with Peter Sullivan and Enka uh, when I had a sabbatical leave uh, a few years ago. And obviously, Peter is the expert of the LES uh, work. And so I was really fortunate to be able to work with him. And what I tried is to use his data, uh, uh, numerical data, as almost like an experimental data, and then just to try to look details and see what we can learn from that. Anyway, so that's how it started. Uh, but now it's kind of uh, 
developed into more collaboration with Sobris, including some of our lab observation work. Anyway, so those are the colleagues, uh, Peter and Fabris, and my current student, Nyler, and Fabris's former student, Mark Buckley, and also my former summer student, Richard. Those are the people who uh, made contribution. <coughs> Okay, so probably most of you have uh, pretty know uh, what's the motivation of this work, but just in case you're not familiar, uh, since I'm in the oceanography department, uh, we are mainly concerned about the interaction between ocean and atmosphere, and particularly we're interested in the exchange of momentum, energy, and heat, and gas. So those are the four uh, things which ocean and atmosphere exchange, and uh, these uh, exchanges are very important in a really wide range of scales. And I do right now mainly work on the smaller middle scale problem, particularly hurricanes. That's one of the applications we work on. But in fact, this air interaction is also very important in the global climate problems. So anyway, so we really have to understand this is. Uh, fluxes. And in particular, this ARC momentum flux, which we call wind stress, is a really important uh, quantity because that forces the upper ocean. That also uh, affects the uh, atmospheric side motions, and also that is the forcing for the ocean waves. So almost everybody really has to know what wind stress is. Now, historically, the wind stress oops, is always uh, assumed to be related to the wind speed, and just uh, because of the convention, we use, use the uh, 10 meter wind speed. Wind speed measures at 10 meter height. And when the acid temperature is very different, we have to uh, introduce some kind of stability effect. But once you correct for that, we have this neutral wind speed. And we usually assume that the surface uh, friction or the wind stress is related to wind speed. And we have this so called drag coefficient, uh, which characterizes the relationship. And of course, this is a reasonably uh, a good way to do it uh, for most of the applications. But if you go into some uh, special cases, such as under hurricanes, for example, then it turns out that this approach is not really good enough. And the reason is uh, the way the air basically uh, pushes the water, they apply the force, is mainly because uh, there's a so-called pressure drag, which is the pressure pushing the wavy surface, the surface waves. That is really the dominant way wind is pushing the water and then applying the uh, transfer momentum. And th because of that, uh, the shape of the surface uh, matters, which means the sea state or the ocean wave field is very important. And if you have a very different sea state, then you expect that this uh, momentum flux will be different. And so we certainly have to worry about this sea surface uh, state effect, particularly when the sea surface is not locally uh, imbalanced with wind forcing. And so obviously when the wind is just starting and the waves are just beginning, uh, they are far from so-called fully mature state. And in those conditions, this uh, wind stress can be very, very different. So ultimately what we want to try is to be able to predict uh, not just on uh, wind stress or drug coefficient but also we want to predict the wind profile uh, near the surface because uh, if you're interested in uh, any kind of process happening very close to the surface for example if you're interested in the spray dynamics then you really have to know uh, not just the drug coefficient but actually the airflow itself so what we're trying to do is to be able to predict the wind profile and the drug coefficient over a, any kind of sea surface conditions uh, or the surface wave spectrum. And more simply, my question is, if you have waves, then why do you have more drop of drag, uh, more wind stress? Why the surface gets it, uh, has more friction? Okay. So that's the kind of very simple question. And to answer that, uh, first you have to realize we have very different three regimes of this question. Uh, the ones which I'm talking about today is when the wind is very strong and the waves are not as big. So the wind is faster than waves. And those are the conditions which is most important, particularly under high wind conditions. But there are other two conditions which is also very interesting. One is the one which uh, 
uh, Jim McWilliams talked about yesterday, when the wind is very uh, low and waves are very large, then you have a completely different regime. Uh, and that's also a very interesting problem, but I don't talk about that today. Uh, the other problem, which is really, to me, is completely in the dark, is when the wind and waves are in uh, different directions. And normally, we don't see that happening, but under hurricanes or very severe storms, uh, you have actually condition when the wind and the waves are going in a really completely different directions. And to my knowledge, uh, we really don't know anything about this condition. So that's another thing I want to investigate, but not today. <coughs> right. Anyway, so exactly what I want to try is to basically understand actually what's happening of the wind profile. All right, so I think actually the Ori Maxson and also Jim McWilliams showed very interesting uh, plot like this as well. But the, the key point is that when you look at the wind profile over the ocean or any surface, uh, particularly over the flat surface, we know that uh, uh, wind profile, the turbulent wind profile, is basically the, the simple the shear turbulent shear flow profile, which is log, log profile. So if you plot the wind speed as a function of the uh, log of the height, it's just a, a straight line. And uh, in the real ocean surface, this happens uh, usually in the first maybe 100 meters, because if you go too high, then you start to see this uh, turning of the wind due to Coriolis force. But in the first 50 to 100 meters, you can pretty much assume that the wind profile over the ocean kind of looks like this. Except that if you go very, very close to the surface, then start, they start to deviate from the log. And actually, this green is more like the typical wind profile over the ocean surface. So in the far field, it's just a simple log. But as you approach the surface, they start to deviate. Now, uh, typically, if you think about, again, this flat surface condition, then you can always find this uh, wind profile going to zero at some height, because it's a log. And we call this a roughness height. So uh, sometimes we can use this roughness height as characterizing the actual state of the sea surface, and also roughness height would uniquely determine the relation between wind speed and wind stress. So drag coefficient can be actually uh, expressed in terms of roughness length, if you like. Now, once you then introduce the waviness, then, of course, right at the surface, the roughness is the same, so the wind speed should start from about the same level, but then the wind profiles start to deviate from log, and before they become the log, and by the time they become log, you will see that the wind stress has shifted. And this shift, in this case, is the reason why if you have the same wind stress, the wind speed has decreased. So that means the drag coefficient or the friction increased. Anyway. So this is basically what's happening. And so to understand this impact of the wave, you have to understand how much this deviation happens and why. And you have to be able to predict this deviation. So that's really the bottom line of this question. But that is not very simple. And anyway, so anyway, let me just review what we have been doing uh, historically. And if you have the simple uh, shear layer, uh, we normally do is standard Reynolds decomposition between the horizontal mean average and turbulent fluctuations. But over wavy surface, uh, you don't do that. But instead, you assume that the wavy surface is prescribed and that's not part of the random turbulence but we actually know what the waves uh, are look like and then if you look at the wind over that then not only the wind have some kind of mean horizontal component but also there are some wavy perturbation of the wind field which is not random turbulence but that it's a uh, wave correlated part of the motion so we call this wave induced motion so you have like uh, two different averaging. One is the ensemble averaging, and then the second averaging is the horizontal average. Okay. So you can separate the velocity into the real random turbulence and the wavy perturbation and the horizontal. Okay. If you do this and then put that into the momentum equation and under steady horizontal conditions, then of course you have so-called a constant stress layer uh, where the uh, wind stress, but the stress above the uh, frictional stress has to be constant with height, because otherwise the 
wind has to be accelerated. So in the steady state, uh, there's a constant stress layer, and the only way you can transfer this stress uh, is to have two processes. One is turbulent rain or stress, and the other one is over the wave induced stress. So they are both kind of cross correlation term, but one is the random part, the other one is more predictable wave correlated part. Uh, of course, if you go very close to the surface, you have viscosity, but that's uh, outside the regime of what we're talking about. <coughs> anyway. So, in the regular shear layer, we basically uh, use the fact that this turbulent rainbow stress is constant, and that is the way we come up with this low solution. But when you are close to the surface uh, waves, then you have this wave induced stress, but since the total stress is still constant, if you have any kind of wave induced stress, then that means that the terminal inner stress has to go down to preserve the total. And usually that means that the turbulence is then weaker. Okay? If you have less turbulent stress, that usually is because the turbulence is weak. And if the turbulence is weak, then that means probably you have less amount of turbulence generated also at the same time. And since the generation of turbulence is usually related to the wind shear, that suggests that very close to the surface, the wind shear is actually de decreased. So the wind speed uh, increases slower. So this is the kind of the idea which has been developed for many, many years. Uh, one of the earlier work by Peter Janssen and quite a bit of other work. Now, and this is actually the framework of a lot of modeling work. But this is actually not really appropriate because we have a big uh, energy going on here. And the reason is, when we define this wave into stress, we are looking at this horizontal average of wave perturbation UW. Okay? But if you want to do the horizontal average, then you want to be above any kind of waves. Because once you are lower than any kind of wave crest, then your horizontal average starts to uh, see some water, which of course you don't want to do that. So this idea of wave induced stress and horizontal average only works uh, above the highest level of wave crest. But in reality, it turns out that most of the interesting wave perturbations happen in the very, very close to the surface, which uh, sometimes we call it in a layer. And usually that thickness is actually comparable or even less than wave average. So actually most of the interesting action happens below the uh, level of the crest. So if you apply this horizontal average, you miss almost everything important. Okay. Now the other thing which is also kind of puzzling, at least for me for a long time, was that right at this interface, we knew that the reason why the wind forced away uh, or the water is because we have this foam drag, which is mainly the pressure force. So it's really not related to any kind of this U2W2 kind, kind of work term. But how this wave induced stress you define far above is related to this foam drag at the <coughs> interface. This relationship was also very unclear to me. And so those are the things which uh, has been always a problem and we, I didn't really know what to do with those for a long time. <coughs> However, when I went to Anchor and I started to work with Peter, the first thing I did is I basically asked Peter what he is solving in his LAS code. And he basically explained to me how he used this map coordinate and then put that in the LAS code. And then he showed me the equations. And that equation looks completely different from what I expected. And anyway, so obviously what you have to do is you have to introduce some kind of this so-called wavy coordinate. So if you think about this theta as a new coordinate, then the theta equals zero has to be exactly at the wavy surface of which you want to resolve. But usually we want to make this coordinate to kind of become more flat as you go far away, so that, for example, in the case of LES, you have the flat uh, top. So you want to have the flat top. In the case of uh, real applications, you want to make things kind of more exponentially decaying. Something. Anyway, so this is what you want to do. And I used to think that this kind of mapping will introduce a very, very, very complicated equations. But it turns out that's not true. And this is the equation he was solving in the LES. And there are two different velocities here. One is this big U and big W. And these are the two velocities which is uh, perpendicular or normal to this so-called this constant plane of either constant theta or constant C. So you can always have this normal cross component of the velocity to this uh, map coordinate. And then you have also small u and w, which is actually original 
velocity u and w in the x, y, z coordinate. And the key here is to write the momentum equation by the mixture of those small u and big u. And physically, what you write is the equation of the momentum which is still in the original x direction. So although you introduce this curvy coordinate, physically you still keep track of the momentum which is in the same x direction. And so this, if you look at this term, and then in the steady homogeneous again case, all the term drops out, but this is the only term left in the horizontal momentum equations. So this dd theta is the change in vertical theta. So from one level of the wavy surface to the next level of the wavy surface, you basically start to see this gradient. And the quantity inside this parentheses actually turns out to be exactly the amount of momentum flux physically. And this is basically saying that the flux is constant. The only difference is that that constant flux is applied from one wavy surface to the next wavy surface. But since the flux is conserved, physically this is still the only constraint. And then inside this parenthesis, you basically see there are three ways you can transfer the momentum vertically, but at some tilted angle. So the first two is the traditional term. One is the turbulent fluctuation. So you actually add back the turbulent fluctuation small u prime by the advective velocity of big W prime, which is normal to this curvy coordinate. So you are actually transferring this U momentum across this tilted surface. And if you think about this U prime as a temperature, you can even see clearly that you are basically transferring the some quantity across this tilted surface. And then if you have the wavy perturbation, then you have the counterpart of that. And in the X Z coordinate, those are the only two. But in the third, this is a new term in this curvy coordinate, is the pressure term. If you have this tilted surface, if you have the pressure pushing this tilted surface, then this pressure times the gradient is another force which is pushing from the left hand side to the right hand side of this boundary. So this is the third way the air above can push the air below in the extraction. So you have this three physical process of momentum flux transfer. And then the constant stress layer tells you that some of those three has to be constant. So if you then rethink, uh, this is still the turbulent flux, but those two, although they are very physically different, uh, both of those two terms are basically induced by the waves. And they are actually deterministic in the sense that if you know the wave shape, you can predict those two. So we can call this as wave-induced stress in a kind of the expanded sense. And since you have this constant stress condition, if you have more wave in the stress, you have less turbulent stress. So this idea of this uh, conservation of this momentum is still valid. And if you have more wave in the stress, that's reduce the turbulence. That is also true. The only difference is wave in the stress have now two components. And this is very nice because right at the S interface, when the velocity goes to zero, all the force is due to pressure pushing against this slope which is exactly what's happening at this interface. So this redefinition of the momentum flux really kind of solved every, all the problems I mentioned earlier. <laughs> the other thing which I was surprised, again, is that this actual equation is valid no matter what the mapping is. So whether it's a mapping uh, convenient for the LES uh, box or mapping which depending on the kind of how you make a measurement, you can do any kind of mapping and this equation is to the same. So this is a very convenient fact. Okay. So with this, uh, we can also go further. We can write the turbulent kinetic energy equations in this mapped coordinate. And sure enough, you basically get the exact same balance between the shear production and this was spatial, moderated by this vertical transport term. And they are also exactly the same, uh, pretty much. So we now have this way to reinterpret the airflow of waves with this mapped coordinate, and this approach allows us to now look at the turbulence very close to the S interface. And you can still separate the turbulence and the wave induced motions uh, clearly. So, with this background, we decided to apply this idea to the LES solutions of the wind over waves. So, this is the LES uh, which is done by Peter this time. And it's a fairly steep wave, but not breaking. And it's a strongly forced case. So this is more like a wind wave tank uh, experiment. And so first we just want to look at the uh, phase average wind uh, field. 
we are looking at all the results moving with the waves. So in this framework, the waves are frozen, and the wind is going from left to right. But at the surface, the boundary condition is that the velocity is slightly negative. So there is a height at which the velocity goes to zero, and we have sort of the cat's eye patterns here. So the wind is going this way, and the wind is going this way. <coughs> and so this is the streamline. And if you look at the pressure field, sure enough, you have a very large pressure which is pushing the waves from left to right, and that's the foam drag. And that's the reason why we have the flux of momentum. Now, if you look at the turbulence, uh, one interesting thing you notice is that the turbulent dissipation rate usually is uh, increased like 1 over z over flat surface. But over this wavy surface, you actually have uh, this elevated uh, turbulence dissipation rate. And then you have a very, very weak turbulence uh, right inside this cat's eye. If you look at the TK, the same thing, you have a very, very reduced TK very close to this cat's eye. So this is the major perturbation of the turbulence in the waves. So now we want to look at this in a wave following coordinate and try to make sense of this. So we introduce this mapped coordinate and then we plot all the results in this mapped coordinate. So first I want to show you this horizontally average results in the mapped coordinate. Number one, because we are now using the coordinate over wavy surface, you can uh, define the mean wind all the way to the surface. Okay? So the wave height is uh, like 0.2. So this is the kind of the, in a normal KZ space, this is where the wave crest is. So you can't really define any average below this level. But with map coordinate, you can go all the way to the surface. And you can indeed see that this blue is the LES solution of the mean wind profile. This is actually the roughness we specified as the kind of small scale unresolved wave effect. And sure enough, the wind speed goes to zero at that about height. But then the wind profile does indeed kind of differ from the typical log and before they become the simple log. So if you go back, try, uh, extrapolate back, then the apparent roughness length has increased from here to here. And that is the effect of the wave. So how this increase has happened is basically how this profile has shifted from log, and we have to explain that. To do that, you can basically look at two quantity. First is the momentum balance. And as I mentioned, historically, we always try to understand the wave-induced stress as the one which uh, weakened the uh, turbulence. So here, we are looking at this total wind stress normalized as one, and then this uh, pink, is the total wave-induced stress. And sure enough, very close to the surface, this wave-induced stress is quite large, like 30%. So that means that about 30% of the total wind stress is supported by the foam drag in this case. And therefore, the turbulent stress is also reduced by the same amount. So there's a, quite a bit of uh, reduction of the wind stress, turbulent stress. Interestingly, uh, which we didn't know before, is that there's an upper level of the uh, wave boundary where it's opposite. Actually, the wave-induced uh, stress is upwards, so it actually waves are transferring momentum up and still down, and that is mainly due to this so-called wave fluctuation due to the W2-level contribution, whereas the pressure tends to make the transfer down. So in the upper level, this uh, fluctuation part wins, and the total net impact of wave momentum flux was upward, and since you have to conserve the constant stress, that means that the turbulence actually has to transfer more momentum, so the wind stress is bigger than the uh, total so that's the kind of what's happening in the upper layer. And if you look at the TKE budget, it's the same thing. In the very close to the surface, the turbulence uh, uh, stress is reduced, and at the same time, turbulent dissipation rate reduced, production reduced, and since the shear production is exactly the same as the wind shear, so the, uh, the slope of the wind wind also is less. So you can see that compared with green. But in the second the top upper layer, it's the other way around. You have more turbulence and more dissipation, more shear production, and then steeper wind profile. So you can kind of see that there are two things going on. In the lower part, the wind stress, uh, so the wind profile gets uh, less steep. That tends to raise the profile up, make the roughness bigger. But then in the top layer, they actually do the other way down. So they actually reduce the impact of the waves. Whatever. And it looks like this secondary layer is really kind of uh, something we didn't know before, because that was not something we expected in any kind of previous model. 
So we wanted to know why this is happening. Now, if you look at the actual spatial distribution of this enhanced turbulence and enhanced uh, dissipation in the map code, then you will realize that these are happening about the height of the top of this cat islands, about the height of the wave crest. So something's going on at that level where turbulence is actually more intense. And that intense turbulence is actually trying to make the roughness actually exercise somewhat less. On the other hand, very close to the surface, you have a very, very weak turbulence, and that is enhancing the roughness. So something to do with this pattern of the cat's eye is related to these two different impacts of the wave impact on the mean wind profile. <coughs> anyway, so that's the kind of thing we have learned so far. Uh, I also wanted to make mention that uh, what we have done so far, you can redo it with any kind of mapping coordinate. So instead of having the relatively simple exponential uh, mapping, you can, for example, introduce the uh, coordinate which is waving forever. So like uh, all the coordinates going up and down with waves. And you can basically show that no matter what kind of coordinate you introduce, the results are very much the same. So it's quite robust result. So you don't have to worry about how you choose the mapping. As long as they are reasonable, it's fine. You can also use this LES to actually mimic what you would do if you have a very low profile wave following platform which is going up and down and then uh, you can pretend you measure the wind speed and take the mean and calculate the impact every time if you do that using this area solutions then as long as your sensor is far away uh, say above the crest height then they are very good to uh, cross the one so you can do that measurement but if your sensor happens to be less than, say, height of the wave crest, then your measurements can be completely off. And part of the reason why this happens is because you are missing this pressure transport, but it looks like it's more than that. And I think even the normal stress, turbulent stress, start to kind of come into this picture. But this suggests that you have to be very careful if you have the uh, wind measurement sensor, which is very close to the surface, and particularly if the sensor is sometimes below the crest, of the big waves, then you have to be very careful. <coughs> uh, you can also basically use this kind of analysis and come up with the so-called turbulence closure, because that's what we have to do to come up with the uh, calculation of the drug coefficient over any kind of uh, wave spectrum. And so basically what we have to do is relate this uh, reduced turbulent stress with reduced turbulent uh, dissipation rate and production. So these are the two actually existing turbulence closure models which have been used in those kind of programs. And I tested those, and actually one which we have been using turns out to have a very, very good kind of match between uh, with the LAS. So this is the good news that the modeling we have been doing without knowing really all those details has been pretty good, except that we did not know anything about this part. We only considered this reduced part. And so this is something we didn't know, and no models have ever kind of incorporated this in that. And so this is so far what we have learned, uh, because we have this new waveforming coordinate, and redefining the stress, you can now analyze the turbulence of waves very, very close to the wave surface. And as you expected, very, very close to the uh, IS interface, you have a weaker turbulence, and that is the main reason why the waves give you increased drag. But interestingly, if you look at the upper part of the wave boundary here, you actually have more enhanced turbulence, and they are doing really opposite impact. And between those two impacts, because the blue impact is a bit stronger than red, at the end, you look like, it looks like the wave has in introduced this uh, increase in the roughness, but it actually has been weakened quite a bit because of this uh, upper layer process. So this is the kind of thing we did with Peter. And obviously, I wanted to know a bit more about what's happening at this cat's eye. And so I started to work with Fabrice and because he had this very nice uh, visualization of the flow over waves. And I wanted to know what's actually going on. And number one, what we did was we actually compare some of the snapshot, not the average, of the wind over waves. So first time I actually started to look at the instantaneous area solutions, frame by frame, 
and I was very surprised that the wind field actually varies a lot. But then I was very intrigued by Fabrice, uh, his presentation that he sees that the wind over his waves look like separating even if the waves are very, very gentle and sinusoidal. And this is actually an example in his observations of these waves over and wind going from left to right. Sometimes you have almost like perfect uh, uh, separations with high vorticity layer detached. Sometimes you have almost no separations and the waves are kind of sinusoidal. Obviously they're not great in a particular way. Now in the case of LES, we have exactly the same wave shape. We don't change the wave shape. But again, sometimes the instantaneous flow looks like a very much separated like this. Sometimes they are almost attached like this. So both observation and LES is telling you that you have a huge range of regime in terms of the sudden uh, wind field. And this kind of tells you why you have cat's eye. Basically, we are averaging this and this and all everything in between. And that's why you get a very weak kind of separation around here. But actually, that's not happening most of the time. Sometimes we have a big separation, sometimes you have nothing. And the average is the cat's eye. So I started to think that this is more like to kind of the, uh, not just a simple turbulent fluctuation, but more like the quite a bit of regime, which we are just brutally averaging everything. Anyway, so what we did is I had some student, I asked him to actually get the same LES results, but instead of doing all the averaging, I asked him to separate that into groups, the instantaneous snapshot, and do the conditional average. So since we are mainly interested in ultimately the foam drag, I asked him to look at the pressure uh, on this windward side, and every frame he calculated the wind forcing on this side and classified into like five different bins. And if you get like a lowest foam drag group and the average together, you get this result. And then the highest foam drag group average, you get this result. And they are very different. When the pressure foam drag is very weak, then flow is very well separated and have a very much higher TK everywhere, and then energy dissipation is actually elevated quite a bit high above. When the pressure drag is very, very large, then the airflow is very well attached, and all the intense turbulence is very close to the surface, and which was quite a big surprise for me, to be honest, because I thought the airflow separation is the one to increase the foam drag. But this result shows that at least within this regime, the more airflow separate, the weaker the uh, foam drag is. So that kind of completely kind of uh, surprised me. And with these, uh, we decided to actually do far. So number one, uh, with this kind of uh, lab observation, we can do, uh, first of all, we can validate the LES results because the LES results cannot be trusted uh, because we have some parameterization involved. So first I want to make sure our LES results are really good. But then, once we validate, then we can compare the LES, particularly this airflow separation pattern between observation and LES. So this is the kind of new extensions we are now just starting. So although ultimately we want to uh, question about this airflow separation question, the first thing we decided is just make sure that observation in the lab is consistent with LES. So this is the really the most new result just last week. Uh, my students did the first LES simulation, which almost perfectly matched the results of the Fabrice's uh, observation in terms of wave parameters. And this is basically the mean wind uh, shear. And this blue is LES. So as I mentioned, we have this elevated uh, shear at the height of this IFO separation and then reduction. And his Observation also shows the enhancement at this almost the same level and then decrease. So this is entirely consistent that the observation indeed showed two very different regimes, high uh, turbulence, high shear regime, and then low turbulence, low shear regime, which I think is true. We also started to look at the momentum budget. This is not quite uh, final yet, but it looks like he also see a very distinct upward momentum flux due to wave fluctuation. So this is the dotted observations. And they are again almost very much consistent with this LES results. 
And sure enough, both observation and LES shows this enhanced turbulent stress. So the locally, the turbulent wind stress is bigger than wind stress here. So this is a very encouraging kind of compression. So again, I just wanted to show you where we are. So kind of in summarize, and again, I kind of have to say to Ken that your paper with Mike Bunner was so influential in terms of this airflow separation. You basically convinced us that airflow separation is the same as wave breaking. So if the waves are breaking, the airflow separates. If waves are not breaking, the airflow doesn't separate. That's how we used to think. But now I started to kind of wonder whether that reality is as simple because Number one, that idea is only true if the wave field is absolutely steady, stationary in the moving coordinate. And in reality, everything is transient. And particularly, the airflow seems to be extremely transient. And that's one thing. And the second thing, which was concretely, uh, again, I still don't understand why, but at least within that weak uh, flow separation regime, it looks like the more airflow separates, the smaller the function. Which is completely opposite from any kind of our assumption that the breaking waves and the airflow separation increase the drag. So this is the area of which we really want to uh, have a more clear understanding of what's going on. And the at least our preliminary comparison with LES uh, and lab observation suggests that this LES result is not free. I think it is really uh, true. I think so. Uh, we can kind of use LES as a kind of the counterpart of the observations, and of course, observations do not have all the variables, but LES does calculate all the terms. So we can really combine those two together to enhance our understanding of the airflow yeah, waves. Uh, and particularly, we want to focus on this so called airflow separation, and ideally, what we want to do is we want to go all the way to the breaking waves eventually to make the airflow really separate you understood in the, uh, your paper, but maybe somewhere in between uh, we may find an interesting regime where waves are not breaking but the airflow is sufficiently separated. <coughs> and finally, uh, once we are done with the first step, uh, in LES we can turn the wind direction in any way. You can do that in the lab easily, but we can do that in LES. So we certainly have to turn the wind relative to the wave and get different uh, conditions. Thank you. <coughs> That was a uh, very, very enjoyable talk. Um, questions? Yes. Uh, what about when the wind and waves are just like 10 or 20 degrees different? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I haven't done any simulation, but if they are not very different, I don't think it's a big deal. Which is the most normal condition we see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't think it's very different. And in fact, I think even in the lab, I don't think it's a
uh, air flow almost separation. Okay. And so cat size is not really cat size, it's more like if you average half separation, half more separation, you get somewhere. Like that. That's what you see like cat size. But I don't really see that pattern in the instantaneous flow. So that's how I see it. So probably when the airflow is not really separating, then what's happening are uh, what the Belgian hand argues is probably happening. So half the time. So if you just average those conditions, it might be pretty good. Well. That's my view. I have a question. Yes. If, the, if, the, if the beginning you separated the problem into three, uh, three uh, sections, yeah. Yeah. and the, the last one was uh, the wind opposing the waves. Yeah, yeah. And you said both the wind and the waves move lose move momentum. But momentum is conserved. So where is it going? Okay, but momentum is So when you say lose, yeah. Yeah, that's why I'm asking. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> when the wind is going this way and the wave is going this way, then the, this momentum is reduced. And then this momentum is reduced. <laughs> anyway, um, that's something which you have to do with a hurricane that you don't want. <clears throat> Any other questions? Yes. Oh, one clear up. Um, so you mentioned a spectrum of waves, but your waves look very monochromatic. You see monochromatic experiments? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, the experiment that Rich did is <coughs> quasi periodic, but he used so called the uh, he, he defines a phase which allows slightly change from wave to wave, and then he kind of matches the phase and then the phase that way. So in the case of LES, it's perfectly clear. In the last case, it's a kind of narrow bounded spectrum, and so he almost like stretch and shrink every way to make it the same length, like, almost like that. And then average. So it's not identical. And that is part of the reason why we don't have perfect that we should. But, but I think uh, because we are in a very short fetch condition and the weight is reasonably now. So that's the thing. Now, if you go to the more random seas, then you have to superimpose different contributions. That you can only do that with both linear problems. Because you can't allow high numbers. So, flow separation can be a problem. Okay, thanks very much.